with him and find out about all the really good things that the National Wildlife Federation is doing. And I think the first bit of environmental journalism that I ever read was the Ranger Rick magazine, along with so many other people in America. So it's just a wonderful treat to be here. Uh, my name is Tom McHenry. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the Dean and President of Vermont Law School. And also, I go get glasses of water for speakers, so I'll bring you one up here. And uh, it's just a, an immense uh, treat for us uh, to be able to have Colin as our speaker and uh, to award him an honorary degree tomorrow. But I'm going to let all of the introducing go to the uh, director of our Environmental Law Center. And let me just mention, she is Jennifer Rushlow. Uh, she is a graduate of Northeastern Law School and the uh, School of Public Health. Uh, she worked in private practice and worked with the, uh, as a staff attorney at the Conservation Law Foundation in Boston, where she worked on food issues, helped organizing the food program, also on climate issues. So she's particularly well equipped to be here. And as I was doing some of the references on Jenny, uh, the word woke came to mind. So of course, as old, someone as old as I am has to look up the word woke on Wikipedia. If you haven't looked it up, you should do so because it's such a great description of what Jenny Rushlow brings to Vermont Law School. I'll leave you in suspense and give you Jenny Rushlow to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean McHenry. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our 2019 Honorary Degree Lecture. Colin O'Mara serves as the President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, America's largest wildlife conservation organization with more than 6 million members and 51 state and territorial affiliates. Under Colin's leadership, the NWF is focused on uniting all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in our rapidly changing world. NWF works with both Republicans and Democrats to protect wildlife, restore habitat, ensure healthy waters, defend public lands, provide environmental education, and connect people with the great outdoors. And they also publish the award-winning Ranger Rick magazine. Just in the last year, Colin has led NWF's tremendous progress on their strategic plan with the following achievements, working with lawmakers across the aisle to pass a landmark federal wildfire funding fix, to enact a strong bipartisan farm bill with strong conservation provisions, and pass a historic conservation package named after the late Congressman John Dingell Jr. that permanently reauthorizes the Land and Water Conservation Fund. He's helping to defeat, for now, a plan to open nearly all of US coastal waters to unfettered and irresponsible offshore drilling, promoting responsibly developed offshore wind as a clean energy resource, that has paid off with over 15,000 megawatts now committed in the Atlantic states. He's ensuring the mayor's monarch pledge reached its four-year goal of 400 participating cities, counties, and towns. And prior to his work at NWF, Colin led Delaware's Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And when he was appointed in 2009, he was the youngest state cabinet official in the United States. Before that, he was an accomplished student, including as a presidential scholar at Dartmouth down the road, and later as a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. Outside of his work, Colin is a lifelong outdoorsman, a passionate advocate for wildlife, and protector of our air, water, and land resources for future generations. From his boyhood reading Ranger Rick and planting flowers in the garden with his mom, to his time leading the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, to his past five years at the National Wildlife Federation, he has been one of our nation's leading champions for conservation. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to Colin O'Mara, the recipient of Vermont Law School's 2019 honorary degree. Um, it is an honor to be here. Um, as, some, as, as the head of an organization that has benefited from years of graduates of this incredible institution, um, I just want to start with a big thank you. Um, you know, the, the education that each of you receive in these hallowed halls um, really is the best preparation in the world to become environmental champions and environmental stewards. Um, and so to the dean and Jenny, just thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I wanted to start with a few numbers um, because, you know, for the students, and I'm, my, my remarks are going to kind of sound like I'm talking just to students, but I am talking to everybody. Um, you're entering the most 
challenging and most exciting time by ever to be working on conservation and environmental related issues. And I just want to start with three numbers. Um, one you saw this week. The first one um, coming out of a global report is the number one million. This idea that there's one million plants and animals that are at risk of potential extinction in the coming decades. More than 13,000 of those are already identified as major concerns here in the US. A million. It's a huge number. And we just went through a week where only one of the three news stations decided to spend any time on t television news stations, decided to spend any time on this, on this story. Um, there was about eight minutes total over 24 hours on, on one of the other 24-hour cable news stations. There was a kind of a sarcastic story on one of the other ones. I'll let you guess which one. Um, and, then the, and then a different one didn't cover it at all. A million species at tr in trouble. The second number is 50, um, 50 hours. That's the average time that the average child in this country between eight and 18 spends on a screen in any given week. Almost 50 hours, it's more than a full-time job. And so when you think about, and that's not including the 35 hours that they're in school. And if you assume there's a little bit of time for other activities, 50 hours a week. So the third number is net zero. And it's one of these horrible numbers that doesn't pull very well, but it's the amount of reductions we have to achieve over the next 30 years, probably the last, probably more like 12 to 15, if we're gonna hopefully stave off the biggest climate impacts. And I wanted to start with those three numbers because yes, they are daunting, but yes, they are also a huge opportunity because if we don't figure out a way to deal with those three and they're all interconnected, frankly, we will not be able to pass on the amazing kind of natural world that we've inherited from our, from our forefathers and foremothers um, with any kind of recognition for what it is today. And so I wanted to start a little bit today to talk about my journey um, um, and, and hopefully in part like a little bit of wisdom um, for how I kind of got to be here before you all today. Um, but then kind of talk a little bit about why wildlife, why nature, and then also kind of my kind of thoughts on climate. The, my journey is weird in that, you know, like a lot of folks that you know, go to that university down the, down the river, um, I had the five-year plan. Right, so I, I, you know, I get into Dartmouth, I do the thing. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. That wasn't cold enough, so I decided to come to New Hampshire. I traded, you know, the snow for the, the lake effect snow for the uh, the frozen tundra. Um, and I had the five-year plan, right? I was going to you know, get good grades. I was going to go to law school. I was going to maybe become a prosecutor or something like that, and then you know, do some kind of public servicey kind of thing. And a funny thing kind of happened along the way, which was. Um, even though I grew up in a, as an outdoor kid in upstate New York, and it's hard not to be, real upstate, I grew up in Syracuse, so none of this like Long Island stuff, or you know, um, none, of the, none of the fake, fake you know, other parts of the state. Um, no offense, my, my, my regional director, Curtis Fisher's here, grew up in that part of the uh, state that we just basically call suburbia and paved over, um, where we have the actual you know, amazing wildlife in upstate. Um, the, the more time I spent outdoors, right, the more time I spent just kind of enjoying the amazing, you know, the White Mountains and the Green Mountains, um, you know, probably not spending quite enough time in class, um, you know, getting on the water, um, the more I fell in love with the resource. And the more I realized that my hometown of Syracuse, New York, which is an amazing place, um, which has just, like I said, amazing natural resources, but the city itself had spent so many years degrading its natural resources, um, trying to retain jobs um, by you know, lowering standards, or in some cases, standards didn't exist yet. I grew up you know, within a couple miles of the most polluted lake um, in the entire country at the time. At one point, I guess it was the second most polluted lake in the world after one near Chernobyl. Um, this lake called Onondaga Lake, um, which is you know, kind of the finger lake that no one talks about. Um, and, I, and I realized how important kind of having healthy natural resources could be to an economy to attract talent, to you know, create jobs, and try to figure out a kind of a different path forward. And it was in that, through that experience, um, I decided that, you know, while a lot of my friends were going, you know, well, my more public service friends were kind of going to D.C. or, you know, to, to, to go do things in public service, a lot of them kind of cashed out and went to, you know, the major in institutions, most of which failed within a couple of years of them being there um, on Wall Street. Um, I decided to go back home. Um, I went back to Syracuse, which was a very kind of non-traditional decision um, for folks, you know, graduating that year. And this was in 2001. And... Um, I decided I was first going to start teaching in a school where they sent all the kids that got kicked out of all the other schools. I was an AmeriCorps volunteer. And it was amazing for a community I'd lived in that you know, I'd kind of been in every part of um, to have the exposure to a part of the city um, that frankly I just hadn't spent enough time in. Where these you know, kids were, you know, the 
kids were lucky if they had one parent in the picture um, in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of kids had, you know, family in jail, you know, like kind of developing doors. So these are the, and these were middle schoolers that were, you know, between you know, 12 and maybe 15. Um, they were basically just trying to figure out, the, the schools were trying to figure out what to do with. And the school I was in basically became a holding pen in some ways before kids, like they weren't quite old enough to go to juvie or didn't do something quite bad enough, but they weren't, you know, and it was this horrible kind of school to prison pipeline. But we had these amazing teachers that decided they were gonna try to change the way that these kids were educated, um, try to expose them to nature, um, try to expose them to more service learning as a way to see if there was a way to get them back in kind of the mainstream and back in. And, and it was, the amazing thing is that it worked. And Syracuse is a small enough city that you know, the school had you know, 80, 90 kids in it. Um, and it was kind of, it was remarkable to see the brilliance of these kids that have been written off by you know, every type of level of the, ac of the academic system um, because they were cutting up, they were not showing up, they had the you know, truancy issues, you had you know, folks fighting in schools. But the academic intellect that had underpinned them, the street smarts that they had to basically just survive was greater than anything in my school five miles away. Um, though it's still fairly diverse, but not, you know, not nearly as, as poor as the, the district I was working in. And what I realized right there is that you know, talent was all over the place. We had to figure out a way to reach it and actually help lift up those lift up those voices. Because I had I had kids that were it was funny. I got in so much trouble. Um, I, I don't know if I should tell this story. Are you guys streaming this? Um, the um, <laughs> good to know. Thank you. <laughs> the um, but I got in trouble. So I, I took a bunch of the of the um, word problems from like the seventh grade assessment um, from the state test. And these kids were getting like you know. 10%, 20% of these assessments. So I, I took one and I basically rewrote a bunch of the questions and put them in, you know, kind of in questions of things that relate to their everyday life. And again, I'm not, you know, maybe, maybe it's a little naive in hindsight, but I actually put a couple of them in terms of, you know, like, like a drug deal, right? Like, so if someone, you know, someone had X amount of money and they wanted three dime bags, how much change do they get? Every answer was right. And I said, well, this is no different than this yacht question, you know, that you didn't. He's like, I don't care about boats. I guess I'm not going to be on a boat. I'm going to get my ass beat if I don't. Or my, I'm going to get beat up if I, <laughs> if I don't. And so it was one of those kind of moments for me where it's like, okay, there, there's a way to create change, right, if you can just kind of tap into folks um, in, the, in the skill sets they have and the, and the knowledge they have. And the most amazing part is that we did a lot of projects um, trying to rebeautify and have folks take back their neighborhoods. And a lot of this was like, you know, Habitat projects and native plants and things like that. We didn't call it that though, right? We didn't talk about like the value for pollinators, the value for water quality, the value for stormwater retention. Um, it was just folks making, you know, making their neighborhood look a little better. And what we found was that even when things got bad, even when there were shootouts or you know, you'd have these vacuums that, you know, when a gang would get taken down, and then you'd have these vacuums, these kind of these these battles that would occur. Um, those special places that these kids worked on were sanctuaries. Um, there were places that folks didn't want to harm because they were, the, they were the places that had that community pride um, that you know, kind of survived. And so that stuck with me. I had a chance to work for the mayor of Syracuse after that. We tried to scale up some of these programs, getting more kids outdoors. Um, but what I learned there is that there's a pride and there's a community kind of rallying cry that can come from the kind of restoration of natural resources in a way that if it's done locally and authentically. And we created a bunch of jobs in the process and some small businesses. Um, but it was one of those lessons that kind of stuck with me. So then I had an opportunity a year and a half later um, to go to Oxford. And I was planning on you know, doing, you know, I, I, did, I did PPE there, the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics program. Um, but I focused on environmental economics. And this was a pretty far deviation from what I would studied in, in school and at, at Dartmouth. But I started kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of like, why are these markets not working, right? Why, why are these waterways polluted? Why are we not capturing these externalities? Why, why have we kind of socialized all the costs and kind of privatized all the benefits? Why, why have we kind of set up these systems in a way that are making it harder for communities to rebound, frankly, especially in places where a lot of the jobs have gone away, but the pollution remained? And so I got, went deep into these issues and, and kind of came out really wanting to work on, on energy issues. And I did a quick stint at the Maxwell School up in Syracuse, which is a phenomenal place. Um, and then I went out to work for the mayor of San Jose, California. And the, the difference of going from working for the mayor of Syracuse, where government is the biggest employer, I mean, it's government, healthcare, and the university up there, to San Jose, California, which is kind of the heart of Silicon Valley. This is the bottom part of San Francisco Bay. This is, you know, where Cisco and eBay and you know, Google's up the street, where government's not even the center of the universe at all. Um, it's, in some cases, it's almost an afterthought. Um, in some ways, that's good. In some ways, that's absolutely terrifying given some of what's going on, but the, it, was a, it was a different experience where their goal was to try to figure out how do you attack, attract the best talent in the world. There's huge inequities there too, which we didn't deal enough with, frankly. Um, but their goal was to become kind of a global leader in sustainability and clean energy and making sure that they were not just innovating the projects, products of the future to meet the kind of climate challenges, but also to put those, project, put those products 
um, into production, ideally in the US, so we're not just importing things from you know, China or other, other countries. And so having those two kind of dichotomous experiences was, was it's so informative for me, and in both cases, both are not logical decisions. Now, the part of the story I left out is the reason I wound up in San Jose was that I was supposed to go to, to law school. Um, I was supposed to go to, to Stanford, and, and, and I decided um, you know, a few weeks before um, I was supposed to matriculate um, that I didn't really want to be a lawyer, which is something I should probably not say in these amazing halls. But I got great advice from somebody saying, look, if you want to practice law and that's the toolkit that you need, absolutely go. But at this point, I'd kind of decided that I wanted to work on these kind of, these, these kind of environmental, environmental issues through this lens of kind of economics. Um, and my wife's a lawyer. She went to Yale, and she's you know, doing amazing things, um, saving the world. Um, so you absolutely did well, and you made, invested wisely. Um, but um, it, it was one of those decisions, right, where, again, I, you know, the decision to go back home, the decision to then go to, Cali to stay in California, um, created opportunities I never would have had if I did the normal, kind of the normal path. And then after that, I got this random call one day from the governor of Delaware. I, I was convinced when the call came in that it was a buddy of mine pranking me, because um, I'd been to Delaware twice to play like American Legion ball when I was a kid, and you know, the best I knew was like kind of the Wayne's world, like Delaware. Um, you guys are too young for that reference, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I get this call, and, and it turned out the governor had heard me, the, a friend of the governor's heard me give a speech at the Rockefeller Estate down in Terrytown, New York. And, um, and he asked me if I wanted to lead his natural resource agency. And, um, and the best way to describe the, the, my insertion into that orbit was there was a chicken farmer in southern Delaware they wanted me to interview with who ran the Nutrient Management Commission. Um, Delaware has more chickens in the southernmost county than any other county in the entire United States. There's more chickens in that county, Sussex County, Delaware, which is a spectacular place. Um, and the state's amazing, right? Because basically you can go from like, you know, Boston to Alabama in like 90 miles in all the best ways, um, mostly. Um, and, and it was funny, they didn't know how to react to me, right? Because like, so, the, the, so the, I interview with this guy and the governor calls him after, he's like, what do you think? And he said, well, the boy's 29, he's from California, and he just seems like, I don't know, God, I don't even know what to not like about him because he's a likable guy. So anyway, so I went through this whole experience with them and the, the, it was funnier when he said it because he's got this drawl and I just can't do it. Um, they put me through this series of values tests, um, which was kind of interesting. They actually, they actually um, how many of you have ever had Scrapple? Does anyone know what Scrapple is in this room? Okay, I got a couple talks, okay. I need more Pennsylvanians in the room, um, and Delawareans. The, the, the test for whether or not I was gonna be confirmed as the, as the actual leader of the state agency there, the, the head, of the, the head of, the, uh, of the state senate, the pro tem there, um, basically invited me down to Bridgeville, Delaware, which is this very southern place, and, um, and this place called this place called Jimmy's, which it, it kind of off and on has its health license taken away from it. And um, they uh, and so we're having this conversation about nutrient loads and looking at you know different types of technology and you know different kinds of ways to dispose of the man manure and trying to figure out the new CAFO regular, the new um, contained animal operating uh, feeding operation permits that were coming through EPA. We're having this deep conversation, and he stops, and he, he calls the waitress over Helen. He says, "You know, Helen, bring the boy a plate of scrapple." And he looks at me, he's like, boy, have you ever had Scrapple? And I've, I have no idea what he's talking about. Like, and so somehow from, from Scranton, Pennsylvania up to Syracuse, like it never transcended that line. I don't know why, it didn't make its way, its way up 81. And so they bring the boy, you know, so bring the boy a plate of Scrapple. And so I, I take a bite and the way they serve it there, um, some places kind of do it kind of really hard. And just imagine like a gray meatloaf. Um, so picture this kind of gray meatloaf. And you know, in, th in their case, about a half an inch thick lightly seared on both sides. They actually put a little, like, they put some rosemary on it, I think, to dress it up for the new kid. Um, and that's why I wanted syrup on it, I wasn't sure. Um, so I take a bite of this mystery meat, right? And halfway through the bite, this, you know, this amazing, you know, state legislator in his late 80s turns to me and he's like, well, boy, what do you think? And I realized at that point my entire future and whether or not I'm gonna get this job or get confirmed by the state senate is dependent on my answer <laughs> to this individual, right? And I actually turned into him and I said, I said hmm, Mighty tasty. I don't think I've ever used those two words together before or since. <laughs> ah. I don't know, it's like if people say wicked, right? Like, as, as the words just don't come out of folks that grow up in upstate New York. Like, and by that point, the boy was fine, the boy ate Scrapple, and I was smart enough <laughs> to not look at what it was until I was halfway driving back to the legislative hall, and the first thing that comes up, you, and it's still true, but if you Google scra Scrapple at the time, the first thing that came up was, it was everything but the oink. So it's basically, it's all the parts of the pig that aren't good enough for anything else. 
So imagine all the pig products that get used already. And this is so, I, I don't know what portion was kind of leftover pig product versus you know, sawdust. But, um, but the reason it was important was that it showed me how important the kind of the traditions and the value of the land and the kind of the connection that folks felt, you know, with agriculture and the land was going to be to my time in Delaware. And I had to regulate everything from the DuPont, you know, facilities in the north and, you know, some of the worst contaminated waterways in the country. Um, but again, I was able to kind of see how personal a lot of these issues were. And, and it, it, the reason I wanted to tell that story, though, is that there's a human side to a lot of the work that we have to accomplish in the environmental space. And a lot of times, what I see more and more in Washington is that we want government to play referee, right? We want government and even the courts to arbitrate those things which, you know, we're in some cases unwilling to actually talk to people about face to face and actually have a more human relationship. And that's why I love states like Vermont and states like Delaware, where, you know, if you're going to see somebody in the grocery store the next day, it's harder to, you know, kind of blast them in the media or, you know, to take them to court immediately. You have to actually work out your issues. And there's some, there's some upsides and some downsides to that. But the, the takeaway, that I had was that we are often way too quick to jump to kind of more confrontational methods of achieving conservation outcomes when collaboration is often possible earlier. And frankly, if you jump to confrontation too quickly, a lot of times you prevent the opportunities for clear to be collaboration in the future. And so the, one of the things I work a lot on right now is how do we shift you know, kind of the paradigm that we have? Because we're living in it, you know, the insanity coming out of the Trump administration um, or even I was hopeful that we'd be able to work with them on some things, but I mean, just the, the sheer barrage of kind of attempts to try to weaken, you know, things that have been accepted as kind of bipartisan conservation practices for years is just staggering. Um, there's a humanity side, there's a, there's a human side to the, the conversation that I think is often missing. And I, and I think part of the challenge is that, you know, we don't have enough folks um, that spent a lot of time on the landscape. Um, you know, a lot more kids are you know, growing up in cities, Kids are spending more time on screens. You know, you're more likely, I, I tell this joke, and people still call it a dad joke, but um, you know, kids were more likely to play duck hunt on Nintendo than they were to actually be duck hunting in a blind. Um, and so if you don't have that connection, all of a sudden the way that you relate to conservation challenges is not necessarily through kind of a, 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 a tactile you know, kind of reference point. A lot of times it's more academic and more kind of cerebral. And so we lose the people side of a lot of these conversations. Right now, the, um, that, that, you know, looking at that one million number. Uh, as I said, there's about 13,000 species right now that are kind of what they consider species of greatest conservation need. These are species that states have identified as basically needing additional investment. And in this country, we've done a better job saving a lot of large mammals and, and waterfowl than almost anywhere else in the country because sportsmen um, and sportswomen have pay excise taxes and license fees. And we use that revenue to help bring back things like white-tailed deer and elk and wild turkeys and a whole range of ducks. Um, but we haven't really invested at scale in the rest of kind of the diversity of wildlife. And as a result, you see monarch populations that are cratering. You see, you know, bee, bee colony collapse in different places. You see issues with amphibian populations around a whole range. A whole range of reptiles are in trouble. A bunch of turtle species are struggling, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, and, you, you know, freshwater mussels, I mean, songbirds, I, mean, I can kind of go down the list, a bunch of shorebird species. Um, because we haven't invested in the proactive collaborative work, and we've been in a political system where you know, one side likes to fund defense and kind of cut taxes, and the other side likes to fund other social programs. Um, but the conservation priorities typically have been left behind, and there haven't been a, enough champions funding a lot of that work. Then the tools that are left tend to be things that tend to be more regulatory, that don't cost a lot of money for the Congress or state legislatures, and so wind up with a lot of battles on the Endangered Species Act. And frankly, some of the work that you have all done has been unbelievably important to saving species that otherwise I think would have either gone extinct or been in a much more perilous state than they are right now. But because of a lack of, because of a lack of resources kind of being pushed into proactive collaborative work, when it would be upstream before they get to the emergency room, we wind up in these emergency situations later where all of a sudden you have to marshal, you know, 11 states to try to save the sage grouse um, and spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to do it, where if just a little bit of investment earlier and some thoughtful planning on the, on the energy, energy development side could have avoided a lot of strife because you wouldn't have had the number of leks that were destroyed over the last 20 years. And so, one of the messages I want to give to you today is that you've been given an incredibly t powerful set of tools by understanding the law, understanding precedent, understanding how the court systems work. And it is, it is an incredibly important club to have in your bag. But it's not the only club. And so thinking through kind of with, with a high level of, of 
sensitivity, which skill set you use in which situation, and having consistent fidelity to the outcome you're trying to achieve, but having flexibility about how you achieve it, is going to be one of the most important ways to differentiate yourselves as individuals, but also to in, in give yourself the best opportunity to make the greatest amount of progress. And the and right now, I mean, there's no better example of this um, than in the, the climate space because we have to do everything we possibly can to reduce emissions um, from every single source. Yet I'm in conversations in DC and some states where folks are fighting over which types of technology should be allowed and which ones shouldn't. And, and look, I mean, this is probably sacrilege among some of you in this room, but like, we need all of it, right? I mean, we need to figure out how to rebuild natural sinks in every single corner of the country. We need to figure out how to reforest and aforest places, do it smart using natives, but you know, we have to figure out a way to sequester 20, 30% more between the natural systems on the forestry side, rebuilding wetland complexes, restoring grasslands, um, you know, hopefully, you know, all in ways that are kind of consistent for wildlife habitat and kind of re reconnecting some corridors, um, and doing a better job on the ag, ag side as well, of course. Um, but 20 to 30 percent of the solutions, you know, could come from natural solutions. The beautiful thing about a lot of those is that they're the very same solutions that are also going to make communities more resilient to extreme weather events and sea level rise. So if you can restore wetlands, the average wetland that we restore in this country, you know, can hold between 300,000 300, and a million gallons of water. So it's a lot of water. So if an average wetland can hold that much, when you pave over that wetland, when you develop that wetland, that water capacity, that water storage, to both slow down the velocity and basically hold that volume, goes away. And so, you know, Curtis and myself and our teams do a lot of work trying to restore these natural systems to try to make the case that not only is it good to reduce emissions, it's also good to make communities more resilient. And it is a side benefit, I get better habitat for my, my ducks and waterfowl and everything, and shorebirds and everything else. But thinking through those solutions that are more intersectional, this is the second point I wanted to bring up, which is really thinking through um, kind of intersectional solutions um, and, and really uh, kind of making sure you're sufficiently conversant across issue areas so one of the challenges I want to leave you with today is I want you to think of any public policy issue that nature could not be part of the solution to solving. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples where it is, and I'd be, you know, challenge me afterwards or during the Q&A. And some of you will say tax reform, and I'll challenge you on that one too. Um, think about health care, right? If we had healthier natural systems, right, cleaner air, cleaner water, healthier soils, fewer toxics in, fewer toxics in products, is there anyone that thinks health care costs wouldn't go down dramatically in this country? I mean, if you look at the places that have healthy resources and you look at the places that don't, cancer rates of cancer, rates of heart disease, rates of, like, of any kind of respiratory illness are significantly higher in places with you know, high levels of pollution. Yet the natural systems are very rarely part of the bigger healthcare debate, right? We try to do this on the environmental side, trying to make the public, this public health case you know, frequently, but it's very rarely kind of saying, hey, like if we actually just restored this forest or this waterway, um, except in cases where it's just gotten so bad, right, like a Flint, Michigan or some stuff in Pittsburgh or other communities where there's just no choice but to deal with the resource issues that's actually driving the, the illness um, or the disease or the impacts on kids. And that's just one example, right? And also, I mean, with kids outdoors and, you know, obviously health care, health care costs go down. You think about something like immigration, right? This seems to be even slightly more of a nexus. But the places that have had the greatest mass exodus in the last few years and kind of the migration crisis, not just you know, in this country, but you think about places here, you, know, you don't hear a lot about the migration crisis coming out of, of Costa Rica right now, right? Places that have restored their natural resources, places that have slightly got better control over their economy, more jobs because they're you know, from the tourism economy as well as kind of sustainable, sustainable agriculture are doing better right now than places like Guatemala and Honduras that in some cases have just pillage a lot of the natural resources. In some cases, you have kind of the privatization of resources, either by multinationals or by um, kind of guerrilla forces. But if we get healthier natural resources in both those cases, I think you know some of the stem of. I mean, obviously, there's a there's a bigger trumped up, no pun intended, you know, kind of fear that's being pushed on a lot of this. But there are ways to strengthen local economies. You think about some of the conflicts in Africa over the past several decades, and a lot of them are resource conflicts. Right? There are places where there's water scarcity, scarcity of air, arable, water, air, arable land, um, and you see, you, know, you see these kind of massive conflicts that come as a result. You haven't seen a lot of proposals from like USAID to try to restore a lot of these natural systems. We'll do it a little bit on the food side. Right? We'll talk about kind of different agriculture practices, even though I'm not sure, we've, you know, I'm not sure that's always been a force for good on the, uh, on the landscape in terms of the way it's done and some of the proprietary products we're often selling as a nation. But again, it's part of the solution. And I can go through a dozen issues like this, but I, I mean, thinking through how nature and healthy systems could be part of the solution to every major challenge we face in this country um, 
is a is a paradigm shift that's going to be necessary to achieve the other big kind of pieces I, I mentioned before. And you know, and, and even if folks don't care about you know kind of the one degree of separation solutions, it's also just good business, right? I mean, having healthy public lands in this country, public lands support an eight hundred eighty-seven billion dollar outdoor economy. Eight hundred eighty-seven billion dollars. It's bigger than almost any other industry sector, with the exception of like financial services and agriculture and a couple others. But yet we don't treat it like that. You know, if a company was proposing to move to, actually, you guys are pretty rational here. Um, if, if a company is planning to move into a city, right? You see, like Amazon, right? Amazon's a good example of this. Folks moved heaven and earth to put together multi-billion-dollar incentive packages trying to attract Amazon to their communities. If you lose some of the functions of some of the forests, some of the waterways, some of the wildlife populations, you will lose significantly more value and have to make up for those costs through additional water treatment or you know, other types of investments, kind of mechanical systems, than, than, you would have, um, than you would have gained by having one of these major employers come in. But we don't think about the ledger the same way. Right? We don't have like, the, nat the natural capital conversation. It's always entirely divorced from the economic development conversation. I mean, I've seen, I've seen governors um, figure out ways to spend you know two hundred million dollars trying to bring an auto plant to a community, but not being willing to invest you know three th three three hundred thousand dollars in a project that would help re retain a, an important you know habitat area for their tourism economy. And so again, thinking about how nature needs to be part of the answer um, to a lot of these questions. And frankly, a lot of you, given the breadth and depth of knowledge kind of across the entire environmental law landscape, are going to see some of these opportunities for intersection, and they're going to be more important than ever. Which brings me. You know, finally, to kind of talking a little bit more about climate, um, and I think the role that all of you could play in the in the bigger conversations ahead. Um, we're headed in some some scary territory on the politics, and I talked to some folks about this over lunch. We can't afford right now to not make you know dramatic progress very quickly. Yet we're in an environment where the politics have become somewhat poisonous, and one side sees a political advantage of kind of demonizing the other side um, for you know, being deniers, and the other side sees it as politically advantageous to demonize the other side for basically you know, trying to have adverse impacts on the economy. And so when you have a scenario where both folks feel like they win by attacking the other side because they think they're both right on the merits and on the politics, that's when you get gridlock in this country for decades. And we've seen this in different places. And at the same time, so that's what we're seeing kind of at a meta level um, in, in, in kind of the federal politics. But if you go one more layer down, I'm seeing folks that a couple of years ago were absolute, you know, kind of denying there's any impacts, terrified to mention the word climate, all of a sudden coming to the table saying, you know, hey, there's bipartisan solutions that are possible. You know, we have a concern about maybe this, this tax mechanism, but we want to do this other thing. And so I don't think we can regulate and kind of litigate our way out of the climate crisis. I think you're going to need durable solutions. There's absolutely a role for that, and there's places we're going to have to push on, and there's companies that are doing bad things, and there's things that are going to have to be done through the courts. But the solutions that are actually most durable in the U.S. and kind of throughout our history are things that have had at least some level of bipartisanship so they can survive across multiple administrations. And you know, the, uh, President Kennedy, when he was opening up the part of NASA, um, he told this great Frank O'Connor story about the, the young lads that were there in Ireland and they would, they would kind of roam across the orchards and they'd come up to a big wall and they would throw their caps over the wall and the, and the argument was that if they threw it over the wall, they'd have no choice, no, no choice but to figure out a way to go get it. That's kind of where we are with climate right now. We have no choice but to figure this out. But the only way to kind of get that cap, the only way to actually achieve that, that outcome is to be much more flexible in the way we're getting there, which means kind of this ruthless pragmatism um, that frankly I think is missing so often in American politics. You know, so many folks, and you see this in the renewable energy industry, right? Folks will say, my technology is better than the other ones. And it's like, I don't care, we need them both, right? We need all of them, right? We need all those technologies to work and hopefully in wildly friendly, well-sighted ways. But the only way we're gonna overcome the big challenges that we face right now is to be pulling in the same direction and basically all agreeing of the outcome, which is to basically decarbonize the economy. And you can do, obviously, that faster if you're bringing in natural systems at the same time that are kind of pulling carbon out of the air. But it's incredibly important to kind of agree on the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And this is where I think with all of the new students coming into the workforce, advocacy doesn't, Jim Murphy and I were talking about this before, advocacy doesn't kind of look like it did even like 20, 30 years ago. Right? I mean, before it was like the NGOs did advocacy, right? Government kind of implemented the will of legislatures and the corporate side, you know, more or less kind of stayed out of it, even though it wasn't really true at the time, but that was a perception at least, right? Like, we're gonna need each of you, no matter where you go. If you go to a law firm, if you go to a 
in an NGO, if you go into government, we're all gonna need you to be advocates in your own right, right? And again, within the rules and the bounds and everything else, but moving institutions very quickly. You know, unfortunately, the huge successes of the 1970s on environmental statutes, which is one of the great global accomplishments for the environment, I think left us complacent. We had so much success over about an eight-year span between the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, I mean, these just amazing acts that, that passed really did help just transform our relationship with natural resources, also gave us an idea as a people that government solves environmental problems. That companies don't really have a responsibility to deal with them as long as they're complying with the letter of the law, and that individuals should use government and the courts as a way to enforce to make other people, you know, kind of reduce their pollution or their impact. That's a model that right now in the current politics isn't sufficient to deal with the scale, the scale of challenges that we're facing. We need a level of collective action that we've never had in this country, arguably in the last 70 years since the mobilization for the Second World War. And so if that's the case, then how do we find solutions that are going to work for a place like, like West Virginia, where there's 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour of carbon being emitted for every for every kind of unit of energy, you know, compared to, I think, I don't know, 10, 10 pounds per megawatt hour, given how clean the fleet is here and the amount of power you're importing from other places, there's huge massive disparities. And the human side of this is gonna become the most important. The reason the cap and trade, you, there's a lot of theories on why the cap and trade effort, you know, 20 years or 10 years ago failed, seven, 16 years ago. My argument is that we didn't get the people side right. We kept thinking of it as an environmental statute and there were politics in the Senate in particular that you know, there's some folks that were really concerned about what was gonna happen back home. There's money involved and there's the role of corporations, there's all these other kind of reasons. But we treat it like an environmental statute instead of being honest about what it is, which is kind of a, a restructuring and a rethinking of the way the economy works in different parts of the country. If you put a carbon tax tomorrow across the country uniformly, the impact on West Virginia or Alaska or Wyoming is fundamentally different than the impact on Vermont. You're taking a, a, you have a energy, you know, and here you have a fairly fossil free kind of, you know, kind of energy mix, more or less, relatively. But in West Virginia, right, where the predominant source is still coal, you're making a product that, again, needs to be reduced, and they know that, that it needs to be, you know, reduced in the years ahead. But you're making it less competitive for them to, to sell energy. You're making the energy more expensive for folks to be able to buy there, and you're making their ability to export the one commodity that they see right now um, as profitable more difficult to, to move. Now again, we absolutely have to still reduce. But then I'll have folks on the other side say, well, we can't talk about carbon capture technology, we can't talk about you know, nuclear energy, we can't talk about these other things um, because they're not as good as some of the clean energy alternatives. And at the same time, I'll have folks you know, say, well, we can get to 100% clean energy here in America, but then you ask them the question about, well, what about China, where there's more than 1,000 coal plants that are scheduled for construction in the next 10 years, what's your plan for there? And again, you get these kind of stammering answers. And so my, my, the reason I wanted to, to share that though is there's a lot of these silver bullet solutions that are going to be presented to all of you and you're gonna be asked to you know, support them or advocate them or work for organizations that are different pieces. We have to embrace the complexity and we have to embrace the human dimensions of these challenges. If we figure out solutions that work for West Virginia, Right, by through a combination of retraining and infrastructure and investments in universities and investments in hopefully, you know, technology is gonna reduce emissions, hopefully huge investments in like things like energy efficiency that create jobs that can't be displaced, well-paying jobs, and many, many of which are organized. If we make those kind of investments in a smart way, not through a handout, but through actual work that's gonna make their community stronger and, and safer on the, you know, over the course of 10, 20 years, and create well-paying jobs in the near term as you're training the next generation to come after, we will have done the world, we will have created a model that can be replicated around the world. Because right now, the two states that have the highest unemployment in the entire country are Alaska and West Virginia, which is also kind of the chair and the ranking member of the Natural Resources Committee where a lot of this policy is going to be debated. Both of whom are willing to both, they both admit the climate is a problem, they're both proposing different legislation. Now, you know, not everything we love, we don't love every piece of it, but they're proposing solutions. They're engaging in an authentic way Trying to find, trying to find that path forward that works for their community. And if we don't figure out ways to find solutions that work in those places, you're going to wind up with this kind of regional sectarian, I don't want to say warfare, but you're going to see this regional sectarian disagreement that we've seen plague so many other issues in this country. And so I want to leave you on an optimistic note because I'm seeing people of goodwill coming together 
trying to find solutions in a way that I, had, I hadn't seen even 18 months ago. I think a combination of the IPCC report as well as the National Climate Assessment combined with just the simple fact that whether you're you know, a member of Congress representing Nebraska that got wiped out by those massive floods on the Missouri, or folks that were in the panhandle of Florida, or folks that were in representing the Carolinas, or the folks that are affected by the wildfires out in California, or Oregon, or Washington, or Idaho, or Montana, or the impacts are real, right? And there's that Barack Obama, Jay Inslee quote about, you know, the first generation to feel the impacts of climate, the last generation that can do anything about it. The impacts that folks are feeling, it's not the pictures of polar bears and puffins, it's not the charts showing 400 parts per million, it's, it's, it's the actual impacts in their backyard that they're feeling. That's creating a catalyst to actually do meaningful things on the ground and through policy, through, through, through legislation and regulation that actually are going to strengthen communities. If we don't take advantage of the goodwill that's being created by folks that are seeing the impacts in their backyard, making them part of the solution, making sure that frontline communities that are facing pollution, making sure that rural communities that are, faring, that are facing the brunt of these impacts, if we don't bring them into these conversations and come up again with academic solutions that really just don't take into account the impacts on regular folks, we will have missed one of the greatest opportunities to level the playing field in this country and create prosperity and zip codes across the country. So I wanted to leave you today with an optimistic note. I think there's an opportunity to not just rebuild wildlife populations and rebuild and kind of solve the climate crisis by actually rebuilding the country um, in a major way. And it's a way that's much, it's, this isn't the Eisenhower you know, highways of the 1950s. It's really thinking through how we rebuild natural systems, how do we rebuild systems that are thinking toward 2150s, you know, thinking, thinking through the next 100 years, um, not simply building back to the way it was. If we turn the conversation that way, it's a much more collaborative, much less partisan conversation than anything you're seeing right now. And I need all of you to be part of that army, be part of that field. And the reason I, I want, the reason I had the Roosevelt quote in the, in the title for this lecture, I don't want anyone in this room to be one of those you know, tired, poor and tired souls that neither knows victory or defeat. We have enough commentators. I got enough folks that are snarky on Twitter. I got enough folks that like, want to throw rocks from the sidelines. We need folks that are going to suit up, whether that's in your local community, whether it's in your state legislature, whether it's within your company, whether it's in your law firm, whether it's within the halls of the federal government, even internationally. We need folks to be engaged. You roll your sleeves up and get involved. If it's just planting some native habitat in your backyard and taking a kid outdoors to get them off the screen for a few minutes to have them enjoy the wonders of wildlife, just doing your part. Because right now, we're in a world where it's somebody else's problem. And I think the reaction we saw to the wildlife report the other day was an indication of folks being like, well, that's government's fault. Government's got to figure that out. It's a million little actions that have gotten to this point. It's a million little actions that are going to be necessary to actually get us out of the mess that we're in. But if we do those actions well at scale across the country and around the world, the world we can create is going to be absolutely amazing. And the pieces are there. And frankly, you know, as one of the leading law schools in the world on environmental issues, we need you guys to lead, right? We need to make sure that there's a pragmatism that comes out of what you're doing that, you know, you're not just thinking about winning the case, you're thinking about moving the needle on, you know, on the resource, making sure that you're always kind of pushing for more and more progress. And that may mean that there's some, you know, settlements here and there that may mean there's, you know, kind of things you have to kind of think about what the best vehicle is to achieve the outcome you're trying to achieve. But if we do that well, the legacy we leave for future generations who won't remember our names, but they will remember that we actually rose up and did something amazing for the future of the planet and left a legacy of, of healthy wildlife and healthy natural resources, frankly, that will live on for generations. So thank you very much for having me today. I look forward to your questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the question was just, is national kind of enough of a, a lens or do we need to be thinking more globally? We absolutely do. I hear from too many people that are saying it doesn't matter what we do here because of China and India or Brazil, right? We have to lead by example. And I'm, I'm just sick and tired of having innovations that were created here, we're not making here, we're importing, you know, offshore wind turbines from Scandinavia, we're importing, you know, solar panels from China, you know, for, 90 of the last 100 years, right, we emitted more than anybody else, substantially more than anybody else. And so my thing is like, we have to lead here, and I'd, I'd like to see the massive mobilization here in the U.S. first, and hopefully use that as an opportunity to reestablish some kind of trade, <laughs> kind of superiority in other parts of the world, and at the same time providing tools and resources 
through grants and through other vehicles to make sure that, that lower income kind of countries have the resources they need to actually implement some of the solutions. But you know, for the National Wildlife Federation, um, we got to do a better job here at home. And I, I have a lot of colleagues that, you know, they spend a lot of time in China and India, and it's incredibly important work. But there still is this hypocrisy, right? Or it's like, if you're not doing a better job here in the US where there are the resources and the ingenuity and the, and the, and the ability to enact solutions at scale, why are you telling us to you know, kind of do it somewhere else? We missed that opportunity a little bit in the last administration. We kind of put some things on paper. We didn't really drive the investments we needed to. But I still think if the US doesn't lead, um, there's no way we're going to hit our long-term goals. Yes, Dean. I was just curious because um, whether you or National Wildlife Federation um, has a position or thought about the Green New Deal movement that's kind of been growing. Um, just curious about that. Yeah, look, I, I love the level of am ambition. I don't, I don't like some of the prescriptive elements to it, and I think you know they're falling into the trap of being exclusive of what counts and what doesn't in terms of reaching you know, some of the emission reduction goals in ways that I think are scary to some folks that are working in the fossil fuel industry right now. I'm not talking about the companies, I'm not talking about the corporate folks. You know, if I got somebody who's working at a, you know, a gas plant um, in Ohio and I don't have any kind of path for like a carbon, a car a carbon capture system or reducing emissions from meth methane leakage is kind of part of the frame. Um, I think it's, it's hard for those communities to see how they fit in the kind of the green future that you're proposing. And so, the, again, if, if you read the resolution, everyone should read the resolution. The resolution is actually a lot better than some of the other ancillary materials. And frankly, if the resolution was kind of the starting point, it would be a very different conversation. Um, but, the, like, and this is heresy, and I tend to be, you know, fairly um, kind of technology friendly or agnostic. The time for purity is past. Like, we're in, we're, our backs are so far against the wall right now, like, we need every technology to work. So I get there are folks that, like, have, I have massive concerns about storage on, on nuclear, right? And I, I honestly reprocessing facilities that work. Like, we need to figure out ways to get those reductions, because I can't close a nuclear plant in New York and have it replaced by two gas plants. If it's replaced by offshore wind, at least it's net, net zero. But we're having fights right now in, in, in Ohio, where, you know, a lot of groups want to shut down some of these nuclear plants, and I get it. They're not going to be replaced by renewables in that state right now. So then all of a sudden now you're adding to the carbon debt. And so I think those are the kind of conversations. I also think that the movements that have made the most progress in this country over the last 100 years, the ones that have truly succeeded have been ones where like labor had a major voice, where it worked for workers. And I think there's, there's kind of dismissive um, attitudes in some cases about we'll just give them a just transition. Well, it sounds like burial insurance, right? To folks that are working, making good wages for the most part, especially at a time when a lot of clean energy companies aren't paying very well because the equity guys are squeezing them to not you know, pay workers. So if someone's going from a $30 an hour job and you know, working at a coal plant, and you're saying, oh, we'll just get you a solar job, and the solar job's paying 12 if you're lucky, all of a sudden, I just lost $36,000 of, of income. And so there's just some like, dinner plate elements of this that we have to be more real about. And look, I mean, this is a trade adjustment, right? I mean, this is, and again, but it's not hopefully just with grants and like just bailouts. It's like, how do we rebuild economies that have powered this country through two world wars and the technological revolution and not leave them behind? And I think it's through direct investment and actually lifting people up. I just don't think we're talking enough about that. And so, you know, I, I just think there's, it's a hell of a hashtag. I love the brand, right? I love the energy behind it, but like we have to have a real conversation about like what it means for regular folks. Because if you get regular folks on board, right? And, that, and look, people can move mountains, right? If there's buy-in, right? I mean, and that's the thing. But like right now, the, the movement is still too coastal, right? And it's too white. It's too elite, right? I mean, like there's just, it's just not an inclusive enough movement. And it's getting better. It's getting younger, at least. Um, but you know, I mean, I just think we have to be real with folks. And if if some of the policy you put in place today, a lot of folks will be hurt. And there's folks who just don't want to admit that. And like, and at the end of the day, I, I'd rather be honest about it and then figure out how to mitigate it. We don't have a choice in some cases, right? We have to reduce emissions. We've got to find alternatives. But you know, this is a problem with the problem with the cap and trade debates before is that we pretended that we made all these big changes, everyone's gonna be fine because you're all gonna get green jobs, right? It's like Oprah, like green job for you, green job for you, green job for you. People just didn't buy it, right? And so like, I just think there's a time for honesty. It's kind of ironic to say that during this administration, right? So it's gonna have to come from other places. And this is where and I think a lot of you that can hopefully have the nuance to kind of talk through these solutions that are more localized are going to be important because folks just want to put food on the table, right? They want three things. They want to make sure they have a good job that can support their family. They want to make sure their kids get a, an opportunity that's better than theirs. They want to make sure they're safe. If you can fix those three things as part of this and make that more equitable for communities, whether that's frontline communities or coal, whatever it is, like then we're going to be in a good place. But if we don't, 
we're going to continue having haves and have-nots. They're just going to have different, you know, just different haves and have-nots. Yeah. yeah, Don. What's the best way to ask the final question of the presidential candidates who are speaking through New Hampshire right now, Bob Bordell, Virginia, and Martha Vermont? It gets beyond happy thought so that they, if it is something that's tangible or allows them not to get away with obfuscation or embarrassment. Yeah, uh, no, thanks, Don. I, Sorry, I should have mentioned before, a whole bunch of members of the National Wildlife Federation Board are here, and I just appreciate all of them. Um, like, I think the best question that you can ask is, is actually on the human side. Like, what's your plan for, for communities that are heavily invested in fossil fuels? What's your plan to actually make sure that no one's left behind with your climate plan? And don't let them off the hook when they say we're going to give them a just transition. Because if they've thought through that piece, that means they've also thought through a whole bunch of other pieces of the equation. You know, I'd also be curious in some cases about what, they, what do they see the role as nature in the solutions? Do they see nature playing a role in this? Because everyone's going to give a, you know, a clean energy answer, you know, 90%, 100%. Folks will give a net zero kind of answer. They'll give a 20, 30 to 20, 50 answer. They'll talk about electric vehicles. The other piece, and this is more technical, but um, we're not having an honest conversation in this country around aviation and shipping. Two huge sources. You know, the transportation sector is obviously one of the bigger sources, but like those are two pieces that you can't easily electrify. I mean, we don't have the battery technology even remotely in in our grasp, um, and so you're going to need liquid fuels of some sort. And the question is, what are they, um, and how are they done sustainably, right? And so again, there's this mindset within you know a lot, I think a lot of the environmental community that the way to solve climate is through another great act in this in the spirit of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, these big omnibus piece of legislation. I'm here to propose to you today that I actually think it's going to be a series of wedges because and they're going to have different coalitions around each of them, right? So kind of getting the transportation piece right on the, on the, on the passenger vehicle side, and there's a transit piece, and there's a shipping and aviation piece, and there's a trucking, and you start putting these pieces together. And I encourage folks to look at like Drawdown and like McKinsey's done a bunch of modeling. There's a bunch of different ways to think about like the wedges. But it's just, Don, it's, it's peeling back that next layer, right? Like, okay, I, I hear you say 100%. What does it mean, right? Like, what, is it, what does it mean for regular folks? And how are you going to make sure that there's opportunity that's created, particularly in those places that haven't? Like, how are we going to make sure that folks of color have opportunities? How are we going to make sure that you know, communities that have been left behind have opportunities? I don't want to trade a bunch of, I say this, my camera's running. Um, I don't want to trade a bunch of you know, billionaires in the oil industry for a bunch of billionaires in, in the, on the clean tech side that also leave workers behind. We've had such systemic un, un, uh, kind of inequities in this country for so long that we could easily tra just change one type of titan for a different type of titan and not restore natural systems, not bring people back, people along in the process. And I don't think anybody's talking about that nearly enough. So, yes. decisions, so much of the talk is, you know, if we don't do something by the end of the century, the sea levels are going to rise three feet, and people say end of the century, who cares about that? How do you make it an immediate impact? How do you get people to think that we've got, this is having an effect on us right now, it's not just maybe our grandchildren will be affected. How do you convince them that right now we have a problem so they'll be motivated to get their legislators to do something about it. Yeah, um, like I mean, the way most people are experiencing climate impacts is through these extreme weather events, right? And folks are trying to figure out how to keep their families safe. Right? I mean, I've seen more, I mean, I was, I was testifying before financial services a few weeks ago and the Houston delegation, um, which has been you know, pretty tough on you know, kind of climate solutions the last few years, just given the number of oil companies that have their headquarters there, asking how do we make our communities more resilient after Hurricane Harvey? How do we like, rethink, you know, we've, we've kind of paved over a whole lot of the bayou, um, a lot of the grasslands, the like Katy Prairie, um, and all of a sudden we didn't have that storage capacity, so all of a sudden we had rivers of you know, water on our highways in different directions. I think it's, it's, it's the local impacts, and I think we made a tactical mistake as a community for almost 20 years by trying to globalize this problem, right? Like the pictures of puffers, puffins and polar bears on melting ice caps and you know, pie charts, and like, I have great respect for some of the folks that did some of those presentations, they were very elitist in the way they were approaching the problem as opposed to saying, look, there's drought conditions, right? All of a sudden your crop yield's going down. If the rivers are warmer, then you're not gonna have a trout stream, right? If you have more winter ticks, right, just eating all your moose, all of a sudden then you're not gonna have you know, healthy populations. We could have prepared folks 
we could have made it easier for folks to begin to make the investments to make their communities more resilient. There's a writer that talks about adap adaptation work and resilience work kind of being selfish and kind of mitigation work, reducing emissions, being more altruistic because you don't directly benefit from the emission reduction to the same extent that you, that you benefit personally from the mitigation efforts. We need both, but if we had made a huge national commitment, starting with the stimulus package in 2009 around resilience and trying to bake in kind of clean energy solutions, not just in 10% of the package, but throughout the entire thing, we could have actually begun to rebuild the country in a way that was more resilient, that would have created that urgency of now. But I think one of the things we do as, as, at the federation level, and the federation is different than other groups. Um, and Jenny mentioned the you know, 600, 6 million members we have and our, our state affiliates. Um, we have affiliates in all, in all the different states. We're trying to hyper-localize these issues, right? So we have teams that are working on, you know, when hurricanes are coming through the Carolinas, you know, what natural systems worked, which ones didn't, why did this place flood, why did this one not? When you do that, all of a sudden you take the politics out of it, right? Because folks are, and the flood water doesn't care whether you voted Republican or Democrat, right? I mean, at the end of the day. Um, but that's a, it's a much better frame to talk about the urgency of acting now because it's about what you're experiencing yourself and what your kids are going to experience as opposed to what they're going to experience over there. The, you know, You talked a fair amount about coal communities and, and needing to find solutions that don't leave communities behind. Could you talk about agriculture and um, you know farmers or communities that are being left behind really struggling right now? Vermont's a great example, the dairy industry. Um, do you have any models of how wildlife advocates and public lands advocates have been able to work with that community? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And, and frankly, it's a huge, it's a more complicated question now given the trade war. Right, I mean, given, I mean, given real farm incomes going down, so I mean, I saw a study that they've done 35% compared to like two, three years ago, um, on average across the country, and the timber guys are doing even worse. The, the solutions that, that, that do tend to work in different parts of the state are where we're diversifying the revenue streams, right? So folks that are benefiting from, you know, maybe having some additional habitat or, you know, the ability to you know, hunt on land, some form of tourism, different kinds of specialty crops, folks are going more towards ag, uh, sorry, more towards organic, um, folks that are in some cases able to monetize um, carbon credits for sequestration benefits, but as opposed to just thinking of the, of the normal, you know, crop to market revenue, how do you think about, you know, four or five different revenues that could come off of the, the land in a, in, a, in a structured way? Um, we've also been trying to work with folks on not just the air credit side, but the water credit side, and try to have ways that if we make investments upstream, you know, that folks downstream will benefit from that can make sure that they're, the economics are kind of working out, but um, the, the current farm bill is interesting in that um, hugely bipartisan package, and there's a lot of these mechanisms that are built in for pilots in different parts of the country. Um, we spend a lot of time focused on the cover crops because, and cover crops obviously have a huge value. Um, these are crops that you'd plant kind of at the end of the season to pull up additional nutrients, and it's normally been thought of as a, as a water quality benefit. Working with farmers to try to have crops that are actually sellable in markets, so maybe a rye, you know, that might have some value at least, and the rye commodity prices are tough. But yeah, whiskey, whiskey yeah, exactly, because you're going to need it after the after the tariffs continue. Um, so having that, but then also making the case that it's going to improve soil health, it's going to improve, improve yield the next year, it's going to reduce erosion. I mean, that combination of values. But I think one of the challenges is that um, the messengers often are awful. Right? I mean, having somebody like me that, I mean, I've spent time on farms, but not, you know, I'm better than some, but not that nearly as good as others. It's got to be farmer to farmer. And so we have, like, a lot of these champion kind of programs where we'll, you know, find those kind of folks that are really innovative doing the right thing and then give them resources in the vehicle to kind of socialize the idea. Um, it's slow. It's got to be faster. And so you have this kind of snowflake models, right, where if you can get to, you know, get 200 people doing that, they're all reaching 10 more people. All of a sudden, now you start to hopefully eventually start to go geometrically um, and reach more folks. But it's we got to make the economics work. And I think the scary thing for me is that you have folks that are so underwater in terms of what they owe for you know, the irrigation system they put in because of the drought and the, the new equipment they bought to try to increase yield and the new and the feedstocks that are the, you know, the seeds that cost, are costing more than they anticipated. So you have all these other input costs that are going up. At the same time, we're saying, hey, can you take out 20% of your land because we want you to do this, this vegetative buffer? And oh, by the way, we want this you know, monarch habitat here. And oh, by the way, can you change your practices and go into more rotation and, you know, all, and, and all they're hearing, right, is that you're taking more and more dollars out of my bottom line at a time I'm getting killed because I have no market certainty at all anywhere. So I just think we have to be honest about the economics. And this is where, you know, the more that we can create stable markets for other goods and services they're providing so they can sell into them with some revenue, ideally to the point where they can actually 
borrow against those streams and use that to repay you know, existing debts. I mean, that's where we get to a better place. It's just incredibly hard to have these conversations right now with so much uncertainty. I mean, the president proposed another $12 billion bailout today because of proposed you know, commodity kind of impacts on with the, with, with just with China alone. So I, I, that, that's the only way to solve it. We have to get the economics right for these folks. I don't think we can ask them altruistically to do more when they're already underwater. Thanks again for, uh, for coming. Great to see you up here in the North Country. Um, uh, kind of a two-part question. Um, uh, to what extent can our diet affect um, our, in the entire ecosystem? Um, um, people talk a lot about, any of us who hang around Washington here, about veganism. And, but to what extent could we change diet? Uh, and um, what would the effect of climate be? Um, I don't think that will entirely happen, but the other part of that is to what extent can we change uh, the way we treat soils and uh, in agriculture? And um, uh, Hunter Lo uh, Lovins and some others have started some sites on healthy soils, uh, soils as uh, carbon sinks, and that, that approach to agriculture and its effect on the entire ecosystem and wildlife and people. Yeah, yeah no, both, both great questions. I mean, I think on the, the, the diet side, like, I mean, there are, of course, reductions that come from moving towards more of a plant-based diet than more of a, you know, especially a beef kind of predominant diet. Um, you know, a lot of the habitat we're losing right now in places like Brazil is, is, you know, you have both palm oil issues and you have cattle issues, right, that are driving a lot of the, some of the deforestation that's occurring in different places. Um, it's not a silver bullet, you know, kind of across the board. I mean, there's, you know, you're, you're talking about wedges, right? You're going to have, you know, potentially, potentially maybe, maybe as much as 5%, maybe 5 to 8%. One of the scariest numbers for me in the um, in the wildlife report that came out the other day um, was that at this point we're at more than 30% of the land across around the globe is actually of the surface land across the globe is used for um, agriculture or livestock production in some way. It's an incredible threshold. 30% like of all land in the world you know, being used for for crops and so crops or, or livestock. Um, the benefit is going to come from not just reducing, but actually putting that land back into some form of habitat, hopefully revegetating it, ideally, you know, with trees where that's possible, so you're getting the sequestration value. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, again, I, it has to be part of the solution. We have to kind of move in that direction. There's some bigger wedges that I think can come quicker earlier. Um, to your point on soil health, um, look, I mean, we're just not taking good enough care of soils in a whole lot of places, right? As things get drier, as we're throwing more pesticides on, as we're farming more marginal lands to try to farm the subsidy as opposed to the market. Um, I also think there's an intergenerational piece where um, I think, you know, if the, the more the corporate, the more corporate structure, less family structure, are t tend to be harder on soils, right, than folks that are planning on keeping it in their family for a long time. And this is why we're trying to move things like cover crops and some others to try to have more regenerative, you know, even just the loss of microorganisms and you know, the kind of different species in the soil because we're so busy, you know, kind of spraying everything that we're killing everything underneath it. So soil health is a huge answer on the carbon sink side. It's a huge answer on the production side. Um, it just does take, you know, more time and more thought in terms of how we're actually farming and what and our practices. Um, but this is where, you know, Vermont has a competitive advantage, potentially given kind of the number of folks that are farming organic here. We just got to make sure that's rewarded in the marketplace, that folks are willing to pay the price premium for it. So you've spoken about um, how, in, in the climate context, how to deal with the transition from the old economy and the, and the coal towns to something that will be more climate friendly. Um, but at the same time, our society is going through a massive revolution with the digital economy. And so we have con con parallel forces at work here. Um, I'm wondering to what extent you're thinking about the how to deal with the new digital economy to minimize its carbon footprint uh, or greenhouse gas footprint from the start, um, for particularly for things like on online retail. Um, but also what that digital economy is doing to the local social structure that you seem to be very dependent on for the kinds of solutions that you're seeking. Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, Robert Putnam hasn't written anything in a while, right? But I mean, this does fall, fall right into a lot of what he was talking about 20 years ago. And I think there's a couple opportunities, right? I mean, the, 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 the decentralization, decentralization of potential economic opportunities coming from the digital revolution allows folks to live in places where the job, kind of the, where the normal company town would not have been located. 
So folks choosing to live in Vermont because they want to live here, and then they're, they're, even though their corporate center may be somewhere else, but they're, you know, they're working kind of remotely. So it creates, and this is where making sure that you know broadband access is in every corner of the country, making sure there are those opportunities for folks to kind of work wherever they want creates a big opportunity. The energy hog side of you know a lot of the a lot of the big the big data farms is something that we've been working with a lot of the big tech companies on, and a lot of them have made commitments to use only renewables to power those facilities. The challenge is a lot of them are buying credits as opposed to actually, you know, doing de doing deployments themselves. So you have some double counting issues in terms of like, you know, what where the energy is actually being generated. Um, but this is one of the big questions that I think, you know, we don't grapple with enough. It's not just the digitization and kind of the energy suck that comes from you know, kind of technology. If we're actually going to electrify the entire vehicle fleet, you know, all of a sudden now all the gains from energy efficiency get eaten up between, you know, basically <laughs> server farms as well as as well as vehicles. And so that means you don't just need kind of clean energy to kind of fill the gap that you kind of reduced to with efficiency. You've got to actually kind of refill a bunch of the gap that you've created. Um, so I mean, I think so we're working on those pieces, but there's not nearly enough attention to kind of what that means. So I, I, I agree with you completely. Um, you're, you're, you're going to see a lot of federal efforts in the next couple of years to try to have more performance standards around some of the technology. Um, around servers and things like that. I mean, and they're getting better, right? I mean, the Moore's Law kind of evolution of technology is still kind of continuing. Um, one of the challenges is that everyone thought if we had all these Energy Star appliances that our, our overall demand would go down. And it's basically gone flat because we, we're buying 10 times more appliances, right? And so we're just plugging things in all the time. So I think there's, like, there's a consumer behavior part. The most complicated part of your question, though, which is one I don't have a good answer for, which is the social fabric question. And this is where I think, you know, a place like, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, Delaware, where folks still are places of neighbors, where you still have gatherings, where there's still like an attempt to try to have more of those social interactions. We need older generations to frankly socialize kids to be more social and more human, right? I mean, I, I spend a lot of time trying to convince grandparents to take their kids fishing because their parents don't know how to. If they didn't do it themselves, so they only did it a couple times, and so again, it's not a, it's not a clean answer because you know it's going to be very hard. I mean, who knows? I mean, Facebook could be broken up into 50 companies, and all of a sudden, some of these platforms could could you know <laughs> kind of go by the wayside. Um, but we got to remember how to be human again, and I don't because I don't think we can actually solve the big big questions if we're completely scattered and we're not. There's no kind of social fabric in communities. I just I think we have to get the human side right. I do think wildlife's connecting in that way. I mean, I think when folks are planting together, restoring things together, doing cleanups. I mean, I think there's some social connections that come from that, but we need to create opportunities for folks that otherwise would just be playing on their devices or you know, playing Halo in their basement until 2 a.m. every day to actually come out of the darkness and actually get into the light and enjoy the outdoors. All of you are great messages for that. Anyone that went to this school or lives here <laughs> kind of enjoys the amazing outdoors, um, but it's just not enough of it, and it scares the hell out of me. Why don't we do one more question? Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, uh, currently a student, came to law school with no intentions of ever becoming a, an attorney, honestly. <laughs> I received a lot of the same advice that you did to not go to law school, don't think about law. But there's something that's really uh, attracted me to the kind of the divinity of, and the purpose of a lawyer. Um, and I, I feel really inspired by the idea that you've talked about, about coming together, right? And talking about the solutions one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, the more local, the better, you know, rather than just calling in the referee, like you said, government. Um, so as I think about my future, and like you talked about, some of these dinner plate issues for me are paying for loans, you know, and all of these other things. You know, I wish I could just be a, you know, a little small town mayor, something like that, right? Or some, some, some kind of job like that, but I, I'm forced to think a little bit bigger, right? To, um, so what are some of these positions that you think of that could be part of this collective action, right? Or sort of this spark to bring a group of people together. What are some of the maybe job titles that we could think about as students um, as, a, as a future goal to achieve? Yeah, so I'm gonna flip the question a little bit in that I think it's easier to start with kind of what types of problems you're trying to solve and then figure out what roles have to be necessary to be kind of at that table. Because frankly, we need more folks that are able to convene, right, and kind of bring people together. And so say you're, say you're trying to figure out ways to reduce, I don't know, oceans plastic, right? Like that's something you want to work on that, that folks really care about and, you know, 
you know, helping here, you know, if I say bag ban, right? So there's lobbying jobs that connect to that. I'm not proposing that, but you know, there's advocacy jobs. There's being in the in the supermarket industry, right? Trying to change from within, which is obviously incredibly difficult. There's folks on the policy side, whether that's in government or either on the elected side or on the on the civil service side. Um, I mean, I think just thinking through, you know, kind of what does the what does that table look like to have all the right stakeholders and which seat do you want to be in? If that makes any sense at all. I mean, I think one of the things I try to do a lot is try to think through like what are all the voices that need to be at this table and making sure we're actually inclusive, right? Because I mean so often like you know communities of color get forgotten, low income folks get forgotten. I mean so like thinking through like what that bigger stakeholder process looks like and then you know there's job opportunities in almost all of those from different angles, right? You know obviously there's more money uh, on some of the private sides that are often causing the, you know, causing some of the, the challenges. But I just think if you think through, you know, there's different theories of change, right? There's, got, there's the kind of, you know, we're just gonna crush them kind of model of change that you're gonna build up enough force and beat them in the courts or, you know, through legislation. And then there's more kind of collaborative models. I do think the more collaborative models are better and more effective. I think there's nothing better than doing it locally. But, you know, there was a model of kind of public service 50 years ago, actually the Maxwell School kind of coined back in Syracuse. And it was the idea that, that the public servant really should almost have, be, I can't think of the word they use now. Basically, they, they, they should not bring their own values into the, into the public, public arena, right? They should be implementing the will of like policymakers. They kind of revised that about 20 years later, and I think the, the Nixon <laughs> regime had something to do with the revision, um, that actually you should be bringing your values. You should be bringing you know, like your wisdom and your experience, and you should be challenging norms and not just simply um, you know, kind of mechanically following you know, what, what's laid out in the, in the law. The reason that that shift is important is that I think you've, you know, I think you can, you can be an advocate from anywhere, right? If, if you decide you want to be at a law firm, push them to do better work, right? Pick your cases better when you're trying to build a book of business, find things that actually kind of support your values and you might have to do some things you don't like, but you can also, you know, kind of be aggressive and, you know, there are ways to raise money for kind of good pro bono, you know, <laughs> work to have that be supported. Um, so, I mean, I, I just, I wouldn't, a lot of folks beat themselves up, right, about like, well, I'm, I'm doing this like corporate thing. Like, you can create a ton of change in a corporation if you're savvy, right? I mean, you have to be good at it and you have to figure out a way to, you know, kind of navigate. Some of my favorite kind of political actors in this country are folks that are disruptors inside corporations. Um, but I, I would start with the outcome you're trying to achieve as opposed to the job you're trying to fill and then think about the best way to be part of the conversation to change that and then just figure out which one of them will hire you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin.